great. Good morning, everybody. I hope everyone had a, a wonderful time last night at the reception. Got some really good drinks and food. And in fact, it's eating, not evening, eating, eating out in a town in Chicago. Thank you very much for your undivided attention. So, today wraps up our final day of this year's summit. And before I remind you about a few housekeeping details later on, and introduce our keynote speaker, we will have our final drawing at 7.29 <laughs> this morning. Because we knew that you guys were going to be out partying, and we wanted to be cognizant so that you could all partake in the drawing. I also want to say that uh, in a few minutes, um, I will be speaking, so you'll be hearing me talk, <coughs> about peering into the future of culinary education. But first, the drawing. <laughs> okay, so today's drawing, we are, we are going to be giving away to the lucky winner three treasured books to add to your culinary library on pastry and baking arts. They are the Advanced Professional Pastry Chef, about professional baking, the essentials, and the third book is Frozen Desserts. These three books are valued at almost $200. Woo! All right. It's a good deal. So, I need the uh, raffle basket brought up front. So, there we go. Diane's bringing it on up. And a fabulous volunteer to come on up and draw their winning tickets. So somebody come on up. Anybody? Anybody? Oh, you're all eating. Maybe I should. No. <laughs> all right. Daniel's coming in. So here we go. Walk around. Walk around. Give everyone an equal chance. Come on. Here we go. There it is. And the winning numbers are six, three, five, six. Yeah. Hey. All right. Congratulations. Come on down and receive your books. yesterday. So I'm going to repeat everything I said verbatim. No, I'm not, actually. So, shuttle buses are outside. Bus A goes to the French Pastry School. Bus B goes to Washburn. If you screw that up, I don't know how, how, how much you were thinking last night. <coughs> so, uh, does anyone else need the further instructions? Yeah. Got it? You, yeah. you need more? Um, I'll personally... On the airplane, they showed us how to fasten our seatbelt, which I didn't quite know until they showed us. Could you give us some more safety information on the bus? You know, safety information on the bus. <laughs> well, when in an accident, put... <laughs> scream out loud. So, but remember, the buses will transfer you between the locations um, after lunch. And they'll probably leave at 1.15, so don't miss that. And then they'll bring you back here at 5 o'clock. And again, refer to your lilac color sheet uh, for further details. Also, a final reminder, if you have not purchased your CEUs from UNLV, I don't know if anybody hasn't done that yet, you could do so at the registration desk this morning. 
This is your last chance to do it. But if you can't do it now, you can always mail that in. We'll give you ample opportunities to do that. And very last thing, speaking of forms, we have one in there that's very valuable. It's the evaluation form. I want you to get that form out right now and fill it out right now, really. I want you to get it out and fill it out because the, this morning, the only chance you'll be able to turn it in is before you leave for the shuttle bus. So fill it out right now. You can do it while I'm speaking, I don't care. <laughs> you can even play Angry Birds, which I'll be doing while I'm speaking. So fill that form out and then turn it in at the registration desk before you leave today. You can offer some very invaluable feedback, such as how much you hate the DMC. <laughs> Please be honest. <laughs> and then um, it gives the chance for Feeny to better serve your needs. So this is very valuable feedback. So after this morning's session, Drop it off, and then you'll be off to your classes. So shall I run, we'll run into my speech? Yeah. Over a Okay, well, I suppose so. <laughs> okay, so this morning, I'll be taking a few minutes to share my thoughts on peering into the future of culinary education. I'm gonna kick it old school style, I'm gonna drop, put my iPad down. Oh, no, my iPad mini. Oh, there you go. My iPad. I wrote several pages of speech. No, I'm just kidding. It's just remi notes. It's just to remind me that, like, you know, because uh, when I talk, sometimes I go off in random directions. So this kind of helps keep no, me no. focused. <laughs> We so, like the random directions, we just don't like the stuff that's pertinent. Yeah. You just don't like the stuff that's pertinent. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> no, nothing pertinent, is it? <laughs> so, I don't, first off, I don't like standing in a single space, so I'm going to pick up the mic and uh, do what I do best, which is roam around and give off some energy. <laughs> so, according to the title, we're going to be peering into the future of culinary education. But you're probably saying to yourself, Nye, you're young. What can you offer me? You're not wearing a chef's coat. What can you tell me about culinary edu education? You guys probably have more experience in that field than I have in my entire life. But what I want to tell you is that I grew up in a Chinese restaurant. So I guess that counts for something, right? I learned to love and hate it because, gosh, as a kid, you lose all your nights and weekends. You can't go out and party because you have to help your parents. And you're really cheap labor at the same time. So you fill out all the different roles and responsibilities to make it work. I also grew up not being the sharpest tool in the shed. I had reading deficiencies. I'm English as a second language, if you can believe that. I had to go through two to three years of speech classes so that I could speak English properly. You know, I was made in Taiwan, exported when I ripened at the age of two, and then brought here to create opportunity. But there was a problem. I had what many call an ADHD. But fortunately for me, my parents were not wealthy enough to take me to a psychiatrist to put me on meds. So I turned that problem into my greatest asset. Because I had to learn to deal with it, I could now absorb information in a multifaceted way, which is what your students are dealing with right now, and you're dealing with them in your classroom. So you can think of me as your worst student when, when you're teaching. But what I've done, is that you know, after I made it through high school without reading a single novel because I couldn't read very well, I put my efforts into a laser focus on merging two of my passions, technology and culinary arts. 
And because I've been focusing on that for 15 years, I want to say that I have something to say about the future of coloring education. But first, I want to share a little story that I heard at this conference. Four years ago, a keynote speaker made us do an exercise. It was a simple little exercise, and, but the effect is that it gave this person a focus. So what he did was he had you guys take out a piece of paper and write out a goal that you will accomplish within five years. So you write the goal on the top, and then you write the goal on the bottom. I think that's how it went. And then you tear the piece of paper in half. One half comes to me, or the, the person, and then the other half goes with you. So I want you to do that exercise right now. So take out these little papers, and I want you to write down your goal in the next five years to accomplish. And I want you to tear it in half. And then the following year, we will post those goals and, uh, and see if you met them. Although I think I got the detail wrong about what you're supposed to put on the top half and the bottom half, because this was four years ago. <laughs> Anybody remember that exercise back then? So what this person did was he wrote down a goal, and four years later, he accomplished that goal, was to turn a very simple teaching facility, which was once a, uh, a darkroom photography lab, and turn it into a world-class teaching kitchen. So congratulations on that. Clap, 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 clap. All right, there we go. It's kind of hard to do that. Huh? Who did that? Oh, who did that? Uh, that an English bloke right there. Actually, do you want to share your story? You got that microphone. Sorry, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but it was a very inspirational talk. Yeah, there's a, there's a microphone right there. You have to turn it on. Okay, very briefly. <laughs> very, very, very briefly. Um, came to Iowa five years ago um, to start a project. And uh, they did, they started me off in the, uh, the old dark room of the photography class that no longer existed. And uh, I think most of the sewage seemed to run down around behind the little room as well, because it was never very pleasant smelling. Um, we had six strange students and this strange English guy um, starting a culinary school in Fort Dodge, Iowa. Um, and here we are four years later, they're spending about one and a half million on a 20,000 square foot um, state-of-the-art facility for us. We've got 120 students enrolled, and we've got three kids working in Chicago Michelin-style kitchens from Fort Dodge's culinary school. So, uh, yeah, uh, it, was, um, it was a piece of paper that I wrote four years ago, and I said, I want to get this damn thing done, um, and just to create something new and exciting for the kids in Iowa. Uh, and we achieved it, but Christ, you've got to bang some heads together to get stuff done. Um, but we got there in the end. It just takes a lot of nagging. Um, but that was, uh, I only remember it because I was coming back to Fanny this time. It was, uh, it was a case of, I still got that piece of paper in my wallet. And I looked at it yesterday. I was just like, yeah, I can rip that one up now. And now it's time to write a new one. Write a new one, yes. Thank you so much for, for that inspirational speech. And, thank you. And that highlights what Fanny is all about. Is creating these special moments that inspire us, that reinvigorate, in, 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 I can't still say, invigorate, reinvigorate us so that we go back recharged and renewed, that we have a focus, a dream, that we can make it and achieve because we're all building a new world of color arts together. And we share our knowledge, we share our experiences, and we share our craft so that the future generation will come out better than we ever are. So, yesterday, I spied, uh, not yesterday, the day before yesterday, Friday, <laughs> I did a session, a, uh, a workshop titled um, uh, Flipping Your Class, Your Culinary Classroom. And it was a great session uh, with lots and lots of information. And many of you came up to me and said, hey, did you record it? And can I get some information about that? Can I get your PowerPoint slide? And I'm like, okay, well, many of you wanted to make it, but because of flights and everything like that, you couldn't. 
So I'm going to be sharing a slip of paper, which I'll pass around later, which will get you uh, into what, what I set up a virtual classroom with all the information that I went through um, online, if, if you want. So uh, I'm going to be passing it. I decided I'm just going to pass it off to everyone in the conference here and also post the video that I recorded during the session. So you can go through that grueling two hours that, everyone, that the, uh, about 30 or 40 of you went through. Um, on a Friday afternoon. So, so I'll make that quick announcement. But one of the key things I talk about is harnessing the power of mobile technology. Because kids are coming around and coming to school with these devices in their pockets, we need to embrace what they have as a tool. There's a new movement going around uh, the country called BYOD. Not BYOB, that'd be fun. But BYOD, bring your own device. Because one thing that we realize is that they all have smartphones. And they almost all they almost all have smartphones. I mean I can't speak for everybody. But a lot of them have like you know the tablets like the Kindle Fire, two hundred dollar tablet. Yeah, remember when uh, graphing calculators were like 150 bucks? So now you can get a, a tablet for 200 bucks pretty easily. <clears throat> so these kids have these powerful tools, and we're restricting them from doing that. At a conference last summer, I heard uh, I was at the Model Schools Conference, and I heard a keynote by Bill Daggett. And he brought an illustration that kind of brought to home about what we're doing resisting these devices. Because everyone's pop got policy saying no cell phones in the entire school, but people violate it. And no, no smartphones, people, because they're gonna cheat. So the story that he told was that did you know uh, back before the Great Depression and World War II, schools used to provide pencils to the students in the classroom. So when the students come to class, they would pass that those pencils out and then they would use them during class and then collect them at the end of the day. So they liked that because they regulated the, the ability for the students to have those pencils. But then, the economy crashed. Do you remember that happening recently too? <laughs> and what happened was they were, they were facing a financial crisis and they, they realized that they couldn't provide pencils for all. But then an administrator said, why don't we just allow them to bring their own pencils into school and use their pencils? And there was an uproar in education. They're like saying, you can't do that. They might use those pencils destructively, like right on the walls, pass notes, or even poke someone's eye out. We can't let them have pencils. Does that story illustrate something that's going on today? There's an article on that site that I'm going to hand out that illustrated a uh, school district that successfully deployed that policy. All the kids brought their own devices in, and their rate of infractions went from about 30 to 40 a month down to two. Because these kids, they respect the right to have their devices, and they don't want to lose it. So they work harder to follow the rules. That's just amazing. With those devices, you create massive engagement. And that's what we want to do. We're trying to create engagement with the technology that they have in their pocket. We want to relate the real world instead of creating that fenced off garden in the, in the education environment. How am I doing on time, by the way? I guess I should check myself. Oh, pretty good. So one of the things I'm also going to offer is that I focused myself to create a technology that I like, that I want to use, that reaches kids like me. Because when I was growing up in school, I didn't fit the academic model because they couldn't deal with it. But with technology, there are ways to do multi-modality models. So in addition to sharing the, uh, the 
the notes and the video from yesterday's session. For anybody here at this Fendi conference who wants to use my platform for free to reach kids and create engagement, to create mastery, I will give it to you. Absolutely free. And in a nutshell, because you gotta think of it, you're probably thinking, oh, I'm already using another platform called Blackboard and I have to wait through that. Or Moodle or something else. But the difference with what I created was I wanted to create something that was a little more personal. So through the years, I created what we call kind of like a personal tutor. Um, I'm so I'm gonna use this personal tutor analogy. I'm the tutor and uh, you're the student. So, and you're the teacher. Teacher tells the student, go to the tutor and you're gonna learn information about knife cuts or something like that. So you come to the tutor and I'm gonna give you lots of information about knife cuts. We've selected 10 concepts for you to master. So I'm gonna give you that information. You can come to me as many times as you need, whenever you need it, to be able to uh, master that concept. But once you're done, what you need to do is you need to come and let me check your knowledge. I ask you a series of questions, and based on your responses, I'm gonna tell you page one, three, five, and seven, or concept X, Y, Z, you did well on, but, you, but concept two, four, and nine, you didn't do very well and you totally bombed on concept six, so I'm sorry. You have to study that really hard. So now we're giving some feedback to the student, to you. And then you come back to me and you say, okay, I'm gonna learn on those pages that I didn't do very well, and I'm gonna check my knowledge again. A different set of questions are asked, and I say, you did better on this, I'm gonna level you up. Congratulations, but these pages, or these concepts, I'm gonna level you down. So, so basically, you're getting some really good immediate feedback throughout the whole process. And that's all it is, is that the students want immediate feedback. They don't want to wait for that, that um, feedback loop to happen. They want the immediate feedback because they know how they're doing. And then they continue to level up the knowledge until you've mastered the concepts. And then you give them that summative exam and they walk on in and say, I'm confident, I've mastered these concepts and I'm going to do well because you're getting the feedback that you need to know to achieve mastery. So that's basically what the mastery system is. And the key to that is I never tell you what question you got wrong. Because we're not spoon feeding the information anymore. We want to challenge their thoughts because, it, because the engagement is about the mystery. You know you're not doing well in these, so go back and study it over and over again until you demonstrated that you mastered that. And that challenge is something that they need. And it works. <laughs> I guess it's the next thing. They're like, oh, no, you're probably thinking, you don't want to challenge your kids. No, no, it actually does work. Because then they realize that I'm helping myself. I'm going to succeed. So that's the feedback loop with what we've done. And that's the future of education, is harnessing these technologies to reach the kids that we're trying to get to to provide them all the opportunities they can in many different ways so that they will become much better than we ever are. So, that's my speech this morning. Thank you very much. So, back to the iPad. Is that the next prize? <laughs> Do you want it to be? Yes. Okay, so, before our keynote, anybody, uh, I see people getting cups of coffee, this is gonna be a wonderful time. I'd like to invite Minnie Siegel up to the stage, right here, while I go through a wonderful right introduction <laughs> about her. Did I fail? Did I pass? Did you, did did I you pass? <laughs> <laughs> so, Minnie Siegel, thank you very much. Let me get my water. Oh. Actually, that's a very good thing, because I wish I had water, too. I had, like, cotton mouth. Do you want a sip? <laughs> no, thank you. Yes. <laughs> so, what makes Mindy one of the best pastry chefs in America is her mastery of temperature, 
texture, and taste. In a word, balance between these three elements. Chef Siegel refined her craft as pastry chef in some of the most prestigious kitchens in the country, with early professional physicians stationing her at Spiegel, Gordon, Charlie Trotters, Ambria, and MK. Mindy's restaurant, Hot Chocolate, is a culmination of 25 years of dedication to her craft. And the passion she has for the entire culinary experience, the Urban Cafe, is a marriage of contemporary sweet and savory food, inspired by seasonal, local ingredients. It features an innovation, ever-evolving menu, oh, I'm sorry, an innovative, ever-evolving menu, presented with gracious polish, first-class service, in a friendly and inviting atmosphere. Ms. Siegel's subtle combination of hot and cold foods, crispy and smooth, salty and sweet, raises her desserts to a level of perfection. Eating one of Mindy's desserts can transport you back to a fond childhood memory, and you know it's very important to create memories, of sweetness that has been taken apart and somehow resembles re reassembled into something better. Miss Siegel was awarded the prestigious James Beard Foundation Award for Outstanding Pastry Chef. <clears throat> I got distracted there for a second. <laughs> um, outstanding Pastry Chef in the country, in the country, <laughs> sorry, in 2012, and has been nominated for this category five times. Six times. Six times now, oh, wow. update bio. <laughs> she captured the Jean ba Banchet Award. Banchet. Jean there's no mark on that. Banchet Award. Do you want me to read that? <laughs> no, no, it's my job. Because we're gonna hear some awesome stuff. This is boring, not boring, but, you know, for, for, yeah. you don't wanna talk about this, you wanna talk about cool stuff. Yeah. Award for the best culinary pastry chef in Chicago, and was named Pastry Chef of the Year by Chicago Magazine. In 2008, 9, and 10, she was recognized for her commitment to sustainability as guest chef for outstanding in the field. Ms. Siegel was also named Share Our Strength 2009. Awesome. <laughs> what? You're awesome. Me? Yeah, I'm having the best time listening to you. <laughs> I'm glad you're being entertained by this. I yeah. And I didn't mean to say that uh, you know, your stuff is boring. No, I, I it's, it's not boring. I know, I know, I know. That was a total faux pas, wasn't it? Um, so today, we can go Ms. Siegel yeah, yeah. was also named Chair of Strength 2009 <laughs> Chef of the Year for a dedication to the uh, taste of the nation. Oh, we're almost stuck here. Mindy has been called Sugar Friend of the Year by Alan Richmond of GQ and her Chicago restaurant. Hot Chocolate was named one of the best breakfast spots in the country in William Sonoma's Breakfast Comfort Food, I mean Comfort's Cookbook, as well as one of the best savory spots in America by USA Today. Most recently, Chef Siegel appeared in the Today Show, Martha Stewart Show, The Food Network, The Cooking Channel, and First Look. Her work has been featured on O Magazine, GQ, Food & Wine, Travel Leisure, Chow.com, Bon Appetit, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, and Chef Magazine. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, and now I can shut up, please join me in welcoming Chef Magazine. Um, so I was actually going to read from a, a script that I wrote at 4 o'clock this morning, but um, now I think I just decided I'm just going to talk to you guys and um, tell you a little bit about my background and where I came from and talk a little bit about the artisan movement and where it's going and what I'm doing with my career. And the first thing I want to say is that I would not be here today if it weren't for educators like you, because I went to culinary school 
And I went to culinary school in a time when actually becoming a chef was a, a vocation and it wasn't like a celebrity status. And um, when I applied to culinary school, they told me that I needed to have experience before I could go to culinary school, which was unusual because now that's not the case. And um, I, I, I worked in the industry before I was accepted and realized that this was something that I was going to dedicate the rest of my life to. I was very young. I didn't know anything about cooking. And I went to culinary school, and my teachers taught me the basics of food. I learned how to make stocks. I learned how to bone a fish. I learned how to carve a chicken. I learned how to cook a piece of steak to medium rare. I learned how to make Danish dough. Um, I learned how to make croissants. And um, it really opened my eyes to the possibilities of what my career could become. And so for that, I thank all of you. And um, I embrace it. And I hope that I have done my educators some justice by becoming successful in my field. Um, when I graduated culinary school, I knew that I wanted to be a pastry person. I don't even think I knew what it really meant to be a chef. I'm still not sure I know what it means to be a chef. <laughs> I think um, it's something that you are constantly learning and it never ends. But I do want to say a couple of points about that because there are some things that are important. Um, first of all, so I started cooking in like the mid-80s. I think that's when the artisan movement started to really become, in America, something that was important. And obviously, in Europe, this is a way of life. But I think that what happened was is that young American chefs went to Europe, and they started seeing all the different traditional sort of techniques that you could use for baking and for cooking. And they brought it back to America, and they started utilizing those sort of practices in their food. So anyway. I get, get, get to my point. Um, I just want to talk about um, the artisan movement for a little bit because I think that it's important. Um, it's what I do. It's what I dedicate my sort of product to be not mass produced, to using local artisan producers, that is, people that are producing with small batches, not overproducing. Um, I go to the farmer's markets. I have relationships with small farmers. Um, same thing with cheese. I use small producers. And you know, we're so lucky in America now because in America there's so many different American cheese makers that are actually using the traditional methods, but they're bringing it here. I like to use food that is unmanipulated, so I have respect for my product. Um, and I'm using seasonal produce. And I think that my menu kind of reflects that in my restaurant. Who's, who's been to my restaurant? Has anyone been to my restaurant? Oh. Not yet. Wow. OK, are you guys from Chicago? Are you? Oh, OK. You guys are all from all over the place? OK. America, or are you from Chicago? Where are you from? I'm in Bolingbrook. Oh, OK. Do, and you teach in Chicago? No, I teach in Romeoville. Oh, OK. Great. Um, So I think that what happened is, is that now, nowadays there's like this very big surge of small companies that are opening up and producing sort of like small focused items like jam companies and pie companies and artisan bread companies and pickle companies. And we're, they're selling their product at farmer's markets and they're really focusing on the ingredient and the producer that's producing their product. And, um, for me, I think that's a way of life, and I um, watched a documentary a couple months ago. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with it, Jiro Dreams of Sushi. Are you guys familiar with it? It should be a requirement for all students to watch the movie. Um, so for those of you who haven't seen it, you guys got to see it. Um, but it's, it's about a very old sushi chef in Japan, and he has a very small restaurant in the... the 
the subway. And he's considered to be one of the best sushi chefs in the world. And, um, you know, he's in his 80s and he's still working. And he talks about um, five attributes that make a great chef. And when I watched this, I was absolutely moved by it because it's something that I feel that I live every day in my career and I try to teach my staff. And that is that we take our work very seriously. And we aspire to always be better. We maintain cleanliness throughout our work day. We're leaders and we're mentors. And I think that one is really important because as being a chef and owning my own restaurant, it's very important to teach your employees, especially the ones that want to become a chef, that they should always do and be the right kind of chef. And then also to be passionate about your work, and that's really important because having passion for what you do, whether it's teaching or it's cooking or it's having a business or whatever it is, being passionate I think is, is contagious. I think that people feel your passion. And um, there's a term in, in Japanese and it's called shokunin. I don't know if any of you know what that means, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a word that means a craftsman or artisan, someone who dedicates their life to their work and it's spiritual as well as material. And it's a lifetime of working and learning your craft. And, I try to teach my, the kids that are, that are working in my kitchen, and I say kids because they are kids, um, that you never stop learning. You're always learning. And that it takes this lifetime that you are in to master this. And hopefully they understand it and they move on and they become great chefs too. Um, I think it's also important to teach your staff sustainability and agriculture, the slow food movement, which I think is very important. I think that's also part of the artisan movement. Um, and I think it's important to teach them how to think for themselves in the kitchen. And I think that that is one of the most important things, because the first thing I tell my staff when they come to work for me is I say, welcome to, welcome to Hot Chocolate, welcome to my kitchen. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you how to think and then I'm gonna teach you how to bake. And I think what happens is that people come into the kitchen and they, they turn their brain off and they don't learn. And um, we wanna get people to feel comfortable. And so um, my plea to you, to all of you that, that are teaching my future employees, is we wanna teach them the basics of what they're learning. And we wanna teach them the importance of patience of learning. And knowing that all of this is something that's not going to happen overnight. And that being in school and learning the basics is just the beginning of their road to learning their craft. And that they should embrace that and know that becoming a chef is a lifetime of learning. And I think that's important. Um, I think it's also very important to teach them that there is an outline of pastry and it's not just about pulling sugar and tempering chocolate and working with, um, with chemicals, that it's really about custards and cakes and cookies and beautiful breads. And um, I think that's important. Um, so I've been, I've owned my own restaurant now for eight years. I'm actually celebrating my eighth anniversary next week. Um, and I'm a pastry chef who actually opened up a savory restaurant. So I kind of wanted to open up a restaurant that was um, through the eyes of a pastry chef, but had a great drink program, had a great craft beer program, had a great um, wine program. And um, that I wanted to think about what would we eat for dinner if we knew we were coming in for dessert. And I think that's like an interesting approach to, to thinking about food because I think we always think about the food before we think about the dessert. The dessert's always the afterthought. And that actually the dessert area of the restaurant is actually a really great revenue center for a business. And um, 
I've really had to learn that, and it's been it's been hard. It hasn't been easy. Um, but again, I'm going into my eighth year. I just won the Beard Award, or I received it in 2012, which is very exciting. It doesn't really mean anything. It just means I have to work harder, and I have to learn more about my craft, and I have to be more humble. It doesn't mean that now I've learned something, and now I can relax. Um, in fact, um, it makes me feel like the 25 years that I've been cooking and baking, I think I'm now ready to do what I really wanted to do, and that's open up a bakery. So um, I'm going to open up a bakery in Chicago and um, hope that I can learn and, and start my learning process all over again. Um, and that's really all I have to say. Um, I do want to thank you all for listening to me, and I'm sure you all have questions for me about my restaurant, so I'm welcome to answer your questions and start a dialogue there. Yes. Can we get in tonight? Yes, absolutely. Yes? Yeah. Yay. How many of you? Just let me know how many. We'll, we'll make it happen. Everybody. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> you know, I have a 75-seat um, restaurant, and um, this year, in May, I decided to close my restaurant and renovate it, and there was nothing wrong with my business. My business was making money, and um, we were busy. Um, I just felt like, personally, I needed to revamp my restaurant, and what I did was I just really opened the restaurant and changed the colors of the restaurant and opened up the front, and really, I breathed a lot of life into my restaurant, and we're really busy. And um, it's really great, and it just goes to show you that reinventing yourself and constantly evolving is a really, really important thing. And I'm sure that all you guys as educators feel the same way, which is probably why you're here, correct? <laughs> Let me know who wants to come tonight after this, and we'll uh, <laughs> love to have you. Awesome. So uh, we have this mic again for questions and answers, so come on up and uh, ask her. Don't be shy. Three. Don't be shy. Um, I'm also going to be coming around. I have this uh, slip with information, uh, and also I'm going to collect that she would take like what you guys to do the exercise. And we're going to hold on to that for a year. So, anybody? Um, with your new employees, how do you teach them how to think? What, you, what is your process? Um, well, I, I wish I would have brought it because um, I have sort of like a little booklet that I give my new employees when I start working at my restaurant. And it has 19 things a cook should know. And it's really like a series of things that they should live by as being a chef or becoming a chef. And it's like having sharp knives, knowing how to pair food with beer, wine, and spirits, knowing what your neighbor next door to you is doing so that when you take over that station, you know how to use that station. Um, knowing how to, I, I teach them how to think first instead of reacting. Um, being, I, I tell them that a well-prepared cook is a cook who prepares the night before. To be proactive, um, to make sure they're communicating with the people. If it's your day off, then the day before your day off, you're setting up the station for the person who's coming in and working your station. So, I mean, there's 19 things on there, and I, there, it's, it's ongoing. And then I, I give them this whole thing about shokunin and really mastering your craft, and it's a lifetime and a dedication to your, it's your life. And, you know, usually I can tell right away, probably within the first week, if they're going to make it or not. Because it's hard to work in my kitchen, because I expect a lot from people, because I expect a lot from myself. And, um, you know, I really, I'm in the kitchen with my staff or I'm in the restaurant with my staff almost every day. So I think that, you know, respect is something that is earned and it's not given. So I try very hard to show respect and by working hard with my staff. And I think that um, it, it, it's proven to be successful. Not always, but it's proven to be, I, you know, and, and, I, and I think that also, like, I, I, I caught the last part of what this gentleman was talking about, but I think that people, they under, and it, you know, because I've had a restaurant for eight years, so I feel like I'm a psychology major, I'm not a chef, but I think that 
people, when they know their expectation and they, they, their expectation has been given to them, they tend to perform better because they know what's asked of them and they understand that it's not ambiguous. I think that when you start somebody and you throw them into the kitchen, they have no idea why they're there, they have no idea who the, what the restaurant is or where they're working, they, they, they sort of like fall between the cracks and it's proper training. You've, uh, because of your talents, uh, you've had a lot of opportunities uh, media-wise. So could you talk a little more about that? Like, uh, which one of the things, like was it Little Magazine or whatever, what was your favorite to do? What was the most fun and what was the most beneficial to you and what was the most beneficial to your business? Um, I will tell you this. I feel, and I feel very strongly about this, the best form of opportunity to have people come to my restaurant is to be in my restaurant and to have great food, great service, and a great program that's affordable and that has a sense of value. And um, because if, my, if I can exceed my guests' expectations from the moment they make contact with my restaurant, then they will tell other people and they will come back. And you survive today in this business with regular customers. It's very important. Um, I have been lucky in my career, I guess it's hard work, that I have now, I get opportunities, like the media opportunities, and they're great, and I think that they're all personally very rewarding, but I don't think that being in O Magazine gets people in my doors at all. And I don't think that being on Martha Stewart does, although I did see a lot of sort of I saw a lot of like push and like people asking for the things that I, I did on that on the on the show, but I really really truly believe that the best way that you can get people into your restaurant is by actually being in your restaurant. Yes, sir. Um, with uh, you know talking about media and you see all these uh, TV shows that I don't necessarily watch, but um, they are uh, focusing on the chefs and uh, screaming kitchens and being mean to their employees, just trying to prove a point to do the things correctly, but kind of, in, like, from my point of view, I think in the wrong way. And Sensationalized. Are, yeah, so you are um, in a fast-paced kitchen and um, you know, you're trying to educate your, uh, the people that work for you and, and do the stuff the way you want. And how do you approach that and what do you think about that mentality? Because it seems to be that uh, people that are, don't work in the industry think that that is actually reality, and I don't think uh, it's beneficial for the, you know, for our profession and, and uh, the future I agree. of our kitchens. Interesting enough, because I, you know, started cooking, you know, 25 years ago. I, my first job in a kitchen, in a professional kitchen, was at a restaurant where the um, the chef was a French chef. And um, I remember going to work and being very intimidated and very scared. And I think that back then, it was very common for chefs to teach you by intimidation. Um, and I guess I learned that way. And I think that when I first started out in a leadership role, I thought that, that it was important to teach by intimidation. And I think that as I've gotten older and a little bit more wiser and maybe a little bit more comfortable in my own skin, I realize that nurturing is probably the better way to teach people and that people, when they're scared or they're intimidated, they shut their, their brains off and they don't learn. So I have to constantly remind myself of that because sometimes they do things that they're not thinking, which is why I try to teach people to think first. Um, but I think that you know, America, I don't even know if it's America, it could be the world. I mean, we're just so fascinated with reality. And I don't even think reality is reality anymore because I've been on those shows and those shows are produced. And they cut and they take and they do and they do these things and they, they tell you how to do it. I mean, I judged a, a, a cooking show and there was this one girl that was forfeiting and they knew that she was going to cry. So they, I was one of the judges, and they were like, well, one of you is going to have to make her cry. And they all looked at me, and they were like, you're going to make her cry. And it was, you know, it would be so much better not to make her cry, but, you know, they wanted me to make her cry on camera. And, it, you know, it's, there's a fine line. 
you know? And I think that people that are in it know that that's not reality, but I think that for the public who's watching it, it's ratings. And we all know that. Yes, sir? Did you make her cry? I did. I didn't make her cry, she whimpered, but it wasn't me that necessarily did it. It was the fact that she was forfeiting. But yeah, she did cry. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and I'm not proud of it. I mean, I didn't. I felt bad. And I actually saw her about a year ago, and I like kind of like avoided her. But yeah, it was, I didn't feel good about it. It was not good. This is what I tell people, because I interview people all the time, and they say to me, I eventually would like to have my own bakery or my own restaurant. And I say to them, well, then you are unfortunately in the wrong industry because you should go to business school. Because we as chefs go to culinary school, and maybe we get our bachelor's degree in hospitality, but we don't know anything about books. <coughs> we don't know anything. What we, maybe we know about costing out recipes, or we know a little bit about cost and inventory, but we don't know anything about running a business. And it is very, very difficult because you're going to have a partner that, you, that runs the business for you, and it's your money, and it's your reputation, and you don't know if this partner is going to be, I mean, I, I've heard so many stories about partners stealing and, you know, bookkeepers taking money off the top because it's very easy to do. Um, and it's very, very, it's, it's crazy, and you know, I can tell you that when I started out in this industry, I mean, when I was a little girl, I used to play restaurant with my brother. So I knew I wanted to have my own restaurant. I just knew it, it was in my blood. But I gotta tell you that opening up my own restaurant was the most humbling experience I've ever done. And it is so true that the more you think you know, the less you know. Because again, like I told you just before, opening up a bakery now, I'm gonna have a whole new learning curve. And even though I've been baking for 25 years, I don't know how to open up a bakery, and I'm going to have to do this. And, you know, I'm scared. And because I know what's ahead of me. Now, my parents run my business. So my parents are the people that write the checks. And they, my mother is the one who does my books. So she's not cheating for me um, or stealing for me. But, um, you know, I am very scared for the day that they will not be able to do it anymore, and I'm growing now, and so we're trying to come up with a plan and an idea of who is going to help me run my business, because I'm the chef, and I'm the creative, and I'm the one who's representing my brand, and I don't have time to be paying my insurance and paying my taxes, but I know about it, and I know how much money I have in my bank account, and they tell me, and I know how to run my business, and I know it works, but it's the most, it's the scariest thing, and my best advice to you is when people tell you that, you should tell them that they should work in the field and not think about owning, opening up a business, because that will come, and it's very few people that can make that work. And it's a risk, because opening up a business is like going to Vegas and, and going on the craps table, and that's what I tell people. You're actually taking the, the dice, and you're blowing on it, and you're rolling on it. And it either, they're either going to come up, you're successful, or you're going to fail. And most people do fail. And it's scary. So learn the craft first. <laughs> you had mentioned uh, when you were in culinary school, you learned stocks and fabricating and chicken. What do we need to be teaching now that's more relevant to the industry than what we've been teaching for 50, 60 years in culinary school? Yeah, I, I, I think they need to learn stocks and sauces and breaking down fish, and knowing about the different fish and how to cook fish, and breaking down a chicken, and learning how to roast a chicken properly. I mean, it's unbelievable to me that I have these kids that come through my, my or like they're interns. And I'll tell you this, you know, I take interns. And this is the greatest thing, because this is the first thing I do, I tell an intern. I say to an intern, go get me the chinois. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that nine, t 10 times out of 10, that kid is going to go like this. What's a chinois? 
And I'm saying to myself, well, you've already been to culinary school for eight weeks or two months or three months or however long you've been. So to me, I think the most important thing is to stick with the basics. Let them learn the basics and teach them that while they're in culinary school, they need to work. So they're applying what they learn in school, the theory, they're applying it to real life. Most of these, most people don't go to culinary, they don't work while they're in school. I mean, I worked when I was in culinary school, so I was actually applying what I was learning, and it was the most beneficial thing that I've ever done. Because when I graduated and my teacher said, or my, my chef said to me, go get a chinois, I knew what a chinois was. <laughs> Sharpen your knives. Learn how to season. The basics. So we got time for about uh, one to two more questions. So we got one. You uh, mentioned about sustainability. Um, you know, being from Arizona, I know that if any of you all had eaten a salad while you were here in Chicago, it was growing just hours. The lettuce was growing just hours from my house. So uh, being in a city, how do you, especially a major city like Chicago, how do you institute sustainable practices in your business or, um, you know, able to, to really resource your local Well, good question. Um, very lucky because I work with a group of farmers that um, use um, hot house and hoop houses and um, I'm able to get really great, really great produce and vegetables all year long. And I will tell you that my menu reflects the season. So in the summer, I'm not using strawberry, or in the winter, I'm not using strawberries. I'm not using, um, I'm not using, you know, peaches. Um, I'm using stuff that I know that I can get that's in season, and lots of root vegetables and stuff. And so, you know, the greatest thing about being in Chicago is that we do experience sometimes four seasons. And, you know, we get to, you know, in Arizona, you have one season. <laughs> and that's great, you know. And, Cal you know, I mean, California, I mean, it's one season, but the season's so beautiful that who wouldn't want to live in California? But, you know, I mean, that's part of the challenges of being a creative chef is that you create menus based on what you have available. And so if your menu's smaller or your menu's different and you're using different vegetables, then, or you're preserving in the summer. For the winter, which is also a great, lovely artisan method to serving food. One more, one more question. Anybody? <coughs> yeah, sure. What was your big break? What would you consider your big break? What put you into the mainstream? Um, I think working at MK, opening MK with Michael Kornick. Um, we opened up the restaurant when there was not many chef-driven restaurants. And we got a lot of recognition for the work that we were doing, and, and especially myself. But I will tell you that, you know, people ask me all the time about that, and, or they'll ask me like when I, they feel like I came into my own in my pastries, and I really feel like I'm still coming into my own, that like my, my, my pastries are constantly changing, and I'm constantly changing like what I'm working on and what my passion is, but technically I think it was MK. Could you just tell us how you came up with the name of your restaurant? Yeah, I'm the idiot. I'm the total idiot who had the name of her restaurant, Hot Chocolate. Um, it's very esoteric in its idea that it's not the drink, it's the idea of melted chocolate and what that feeling kind of tastes to yourself warm and soothing and relaxing and comfortable. And I wanted to have a place that could you could feel all that, but it was a restaurant. And it took me a really long time to get people to understand my brand. And now I you know I can't change my, my name because it's my name, my restaurant. I like that it's whimsical. It's whimsical, yes. yeah. It is. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're just being nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great, great, great questions and great answers. Thank you. Um, I do have I one study. question. <laughs> um, because you've had a chance to meet uh, television personalities, who was the most interesting one that you encountered? Um, well, um, for sure Martha Stewart. Oh, yes. For sure. 
Um, it was one of my goals in my career was to meet Martha Stewart. And um, when I met her, you know, she's larger than life. And I don't know if any of you have met her, but she's, she's a woman that knows what she wants and knows how to get it and knows how to articulate it, which is very important. And she, I had a great experience on her show, and she, she enjoyed it, so I passed. <laughs> passed the Martha Stewart muster. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Uh, it was an inspiration. About six o'clock. Yeah. Okay, great. How far is it? I will. Um, it's uh, five, minute, right? oh, minutes. five minutes. Ten minutes. Yeah, I'm setting a little. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. So, a reservation has been made. Six o'clock. I'm just going to reserve some tables for you guys, so you'll, we'll just break the all up. Thank you. Yeah. I have one quick question. Yeah. I should have asked before. Where did you train? What school did you? I went to Temple College. Oh, nice. Yeah, but I went. I went to Old Memphis. Yeah, I had the best experience. I mean, I did. I really got a lot of it. I loved it. I loved it. I have to say thank you for not giving us a magic bullet to, you know, get you to where you are. It's hard work. It is hard work. hard work. That's it. Trust me. It's hard work. Yeah. It's not easy. Now, my hands and my legs will tell you that. So, you know, fortunately, now that I've been doing this for so long, I can't, you know, I used to stand on my feet for like 18 hours. I can't stand on my feet that long. So it's like, I, I have to sit down now and take breaks, which I never did before. But um, my staff was on old ladies so they, you know. <laughs> but the four phones, you got to get some. The four phones, I know. <laughs> they, they, they hurt. But they hurt. I tried them. I thought it's. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you. Again, a real round of applause. So the secret sauce is hard work and perseverance. There you that, go. That, that does it all. That's the magic elixir. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to take this final moment here to recognize a few people who have worked tirelessly to make this year's 12th, 15th annual, why did I say 12th? Uh, Penny Summit a success. Daniel Von Rabino, Dan Von Rabino, uh, Jr., Noris Oliveira, who is in the back there, and Diane Borker. Everybody give them a round of applause. And the rest of the piece, Penny P. Their dedication to create this and to, for you to master your craft has really made a difference. And they want to thank you for making Fetty 2013 a memorable year. So this concludes our general programming at Fetty Summit. We know you'll enjoy your master classes today and bring some very unique nuggets of knowledge back home to enhance your students' lives. Have a safe trip home. And we hope you will come back again next year. Don't forget to drop off your evaluation forms. And if you did uh, fill out those sheets, uh, the half sheets, uh, please drop that off at the desk too. Wonderful. I'm your MC, Nye Wayne, and I thank you for listening to me.